Thank you for the invitation to present. Today, I'm going to share with you results from a collaborative project in my laboratory on developing a methodology for quantifying proteins uh, at high throughput in small samples, in limited samples. And to begin with, let me quickly give you one example of why we need high throughput analysis. We need it because in many cases to gain adequate statistical power, for example, to identify association between a genetic polymorphism and protein abundance, we need to analyze large number of samples and the statistical power scales with the number of samples. Similarly, we need high throughput in doing single cell proteomics analysis where normally we are interested in analyzing very large number of cells. And when it comes to analyzing such small samples by data dependent shotgun proteomics, there is a major challenge. And the challenge is that as we start analyzing smaller samples, we need to increase the accumulation times uh, for MS2 scans, even for MS1 scans, so that we can get adequate sensitivity. And that results in being able to analyze only a small number of uh, precursors of peptides on one hour active gradient or two hour active gradient, essentially per unit time. And this limitation is quite substantial when it comes to single cell data dependent analysis, uh, because despite being able to detect tens of thousands of precursors from single cells, we're able to analyze only a fraction of them. Of course, one possible solution uh, for that could be to use data independent analysis that allows to analyze in parallel many peptides. And therefore, we are, we are able to collect data for all detectable peptides. Now, collecting data for all detectable peptides is not the same as identifying them or quantifying them. That's a separate goal. Uh, but generally, the data independent analysis is performed as label-free analysis. And therefore, we can analyze only one sample per unit time, which limits the throughput. So we wanted to develop an approach that can allow analyzing in parallel both peptides and samples, parallel squared. So we specifically, we wanted to multiplex, uh, which should help us analyze throughput, label multiple samples in a way that would allow us to analyze proteins in each sample individually while we analyze in parallel all labeled samples. And in, in that process, we wanted to explore the possibility to increase sequence identification so that we get deep coverage and improve data completeness so that proteins identified in one sample are also identified and quantified across all other samples. And as we are doing this, we are not interested in just developing a multiplex method that allows for high throughput but low coverage and low accuracy. We are only interested in having the gains of throughput if we are able to keep proteome coverage high and quantitative accuracy high. And therefore, from the very beginning, we designed a rigorous experiment that would allow us to compare the results from uh, label-free data independent acquisition to the multiplexed data independent acquisition. And for that, we used a well-established uh, experimental approach pioneered by others and applied many times. Specifically, we prepared samples here indicated with A, B, and C, in which we mixed the proteomes from different species and in fact, different cell types, either human monocytes, human T cells, yeast cells, or bacterial cells. And because we know exactly how much of each protein we put in each sample, we have a robust expectation for what should be the ratio between the proteins from each species in any pair of samples. 
So this kind of samples, of course, can be analyzed conventionally by label-free data independent acquisition. And to analyze those three samples in at least one technical replicate, we are going to need three independent runs. In parallel, we use non-isobaric isotopologous labels to label each of these samples and then combine them together. This combined sample is then analyzed by data independent acquisition, which we call Plex DIA for multiplex DIA abbreviated. Uh, and in this case, we need only one run to obtain one technical replicate from, from this sample where we can quantify uh, protein abundances in samples A, B, and C at the same time. And in developing uh, this method, we collaborated extensively with uh, Vadim Demichev and Marcus Ralser. Uh, in particular, we uh, used the uh, DINN or the YAN software that they have developed for data independent acquisition analysis. And together with them, we built in additional features to enable this multiplex analysis. So let's take a look at the results. The first question is, are we getting increased throughput while maintaining proteome coverage? The fact that we are going to analyze three samples for the time required normally for one sample is given, but this doesn't help us much if we are obtaining much lower coverage of the proteome. And what we see in this case is that uh, we are indeed obtaining many more protein data points with PlexDIA while preserving comparable number of peptides and proteins identified from each sample. And both DIA methods significantly outperform data dependent analysis of the, uh, of, of the labeled samples. And in this case, we used MTRAC for, for the labeling. Now, another question, next step to look into is how consistently we identify and quantify the same proteins between these samples. And we use the Jacquard index to quantify the completeness of data points that are of protein data points that are quantified between pairs of samples. And here on the left, you can see that there is very high consistency within a labeled Plex DIA set and a little bit lower, but still very high consistency between different runs, different sets of Plex DIA. This consistency is considerably higher compared to the label free DIA run analyzed with the same method of essentially the same samples. And we, fur and we further evaluate it that the completeness of the label-free data independent acquisition that we are getting is comparable. In fact, it is higher than many of the published benchmark uh, data sets, which is indicating that in this uh, very generally very strong performance of label-free DIA of completeness, Plex DIA is able to further increase it. And we uh, actually understand why that is the case because uh, for one thing, we are able to leverage identifications of one protein in at least one sample of the labeled set to increase the confidence of its identification across the other samples. And this is what helps, uh, uh, what helps uh, increase data completeness within a set. And between sets, the data completeness that we are obtaining is essentially the same as the data completeness for analyzing the same technical replicate by label free DIA, which has to do with the protein composition of the sample uh, from different runs being uh, about the same. Another view at the same question of data completeness is the degree of missing data between pairs of samples. Now, if we look at analyzing the same sample, for example, sample A and sample A in different replicate injections in replicate runs, uh, then the results between Plex DI and label free DI are comparable. But as soon as we start looking at different samples, uh, we see that uh, as the proteome composition of sample A and sample B or C are different, 
PlexGA remains at the same low level of missing data, while the missing data with label-free data independent acquisition increases in proportion to the differences in, in this, between the samples that are being analyzed. And of course, within a Plex DRA, we see this low level of missing data of about 4%, which is uh, much lower than anything we were able to obtain by label-free uh, data independent analysis. How about accuracy? So data completeness is not that useful if the data points are not accurate. And in this case, we took advantage of the precise expectation for the ratios of each proteome, and we compared the empirically measured to the expected ratios for the proteins that are quantified in common. So first, you, you can see that uh, the number of protein ratios that we can quantify between uh, PlexDA and label-free DA is comparable, and then the intersected proteins in these one hour uh, runs uh, are um, a large fraction of those identified by each method, about 5,000 in this case, and we obtain uh, high accuracy with both PlexDA and label-free DA in quantifying those ratios, but remember in this case, uh, PlexDA is obtaining about threefold more data points per unit time while maintaining both coverage and quantitative accuracy. Another, an, uh, a next question that we explored is the ability to identify differentially abundant proteins and compare this to performing the same analysis with label free DA. And here on the left, you can see that comparing differentially abundant proteins between monocytes and T cells, these are cell lines, U937 is a monocytic cell line, jerked are T cells. The relative levels that uh, we quantify with the two methods correlate strongly, especially for significant proteins uh, denoted here in blue. And then if we I, and, and then again, we can take advantage of our um, uh, proteome species mixture experiment uh, from the fact that we know that all human proteins between samples A and B should be the same. They should not be differentially abundant. That gives us a strong expectation for what should be false positives. And knowing that all yeast and bacterial proteins should be differentially abundant. Therefore, we can evaluate the ability to identify true positives, differentially abundant yeast and bacterial proteins uh, at uh, an empirical false discovery rate estimated from the human proteins. And by performing this analysis, we see that label-free DA and Plex DA have very comparable performance, except that the resources on Plex DA spent here are threefold less. So we are obtaining the same uh, power for identifying differentially abundant proteins by spending three times less money and instrument time. Having found that PlexDA is able to increase throughput while preserving proteome coverage and quantitative accuracy, we used it for a biological experiment. In particular, we wanted to identify differentially abundant proteins during the mammalian cell division cycle, in this case of, of mono, monocytic cell line. We did not want to um, block the cell division cycle because it's well known that uh, blocking the cell division cycle results in major artifacts. And therefore what we measure may have to do more with artifacts than with biology. Rather, we wanted to separate cells in different phases of the cell division cycle based on the DNA content. And in particular, during the G1 phase, cells have uh, one end con uh, two end content. Then during the S phase, it increases. And during the G2 phase, when all chromosomes are dupli duplicated, it becomes 4N. Uh, so we use the fact sorter to isolate cells from each of those phases. And here comes the advantage of analyzing relatively lowly abundant limited samples by PlexDA. It was fairly easy to obtain more than enough sample for this analysis. Then we labeled um, each um, 
each sample from each phase with a different label. Again, we use non-isobaric uh, isotopologous labels. Practically in this case, we use M-Track. For us, that's a technical detail because what we are really after in this case is the concept of increasing the throughput by using non-isobaric labels while we think that there is the potential of achieving even better results by using other types of non-isobaric isotopologous labels. So this labeled set was analyzed with two different data acquisition schemes. One scheme uh, was optimized for MS1 quantification. Uh, it used large number of larger number of high resolution MS1 survey scans. While the other scheme was optimized for MS2 quantification, more traditional DIA method that had a single MS1 survey scan in the duty cycle and had a larger number of uh, MS2 windows, which of course increased proteome coverage. And then we looked at the results from both of these methods. Uh, first, to identify protein sets that show differential abundance across the, the phases. And the first thing to observe is that the results from those two different data acquisition methods are uh, very consistent with each other, and that's reassuring to see. And the second thing to note here is that uh, many of the classically expected uh, protein groups involved in the cell division cycle, such as the MCM complex, uh, chromosome segregation, and other typical cell division cycle uh, processes are, uh, are showing the expected uh, dynamics across the cell division cycle. For example, mitotic nuclear envelope disassembly is happening during G2M phase as one would expect. Uh, when, when we perform similar analysis to identify differentially abundant proteins, Again, we found that the results between the V1 and the V2 method, the MS1 and the MS2 optimized methods, are very similar. And again, many of the proteins exhibited the expected dynamics. But of course, there were new proteins that we did not expect and did not know that they should be associated to the cell division cycle, such as this protein uh, CDV3 homologue, which is just poorly characterized. We don't know much about this protein. Similarly for JPT2. And we wanted to explore these data in details. We wanted to look at the raw data. Are we really able to trust those results? So these proteins are periodic with the cell division cycle. So here we plotted the extracted ion current, both at the MS1 level and at the MS2 level from fragments. Uh, for, uh, for precursors from these proteins. And we see that the quantification is remarkably consistent. We see that the precursors and the fragments coiled together. The precursors and the fragments labeled with different tags coiled together, and they show the same quantitative trends, uh, therefore providing consistent quantification, consist, uh, supporting the observation that these poorly characterized proteins are indeed most abundant during the G1 phase of the cell division cycle and have lower abundance during S and G2 phase. So with this, I would like to thank my, my group that has been, that, that has made all of this work possible and not only possible, but has made it a, a very fun, very collaborative project and in particular, Jason, uh, here, uh, uh, smiling on this picture, who has spearheaded this project and, and led it from, from the beginning to the end. And this work, of course, would not have been possible without a very close collaboration with the Ralser and Demichev labs uh, that helped us adapt their, adopt their software, Dayan, for the analysis of uh, Plex DA data of multiplex data independent acquisition uh, data. Uh, needless to say, doing such a project requires support, and we have been fortunate to be supported by funding from the NIH Directors Award, from the Paul Allen Frontiers Group, um, and uh, a number of additional funders such as CZI and companies.